their position and how they respond in real time. That's game changing. Well, welcome everybody to another Monday night Soda Masterclass. Let me get rid of this overlay because Paul's not with me just yet. Welcome to another sun, uh, Monday night Soda Masterclass. This one's been delayed by COVID. We would have had it last week, but uh, it was COVID effective. We won't explain any more than that. But uh, tonight we're going to explore some uh, uh, some Sonar screenshots with Paul from uh, from Melbourne. Paul is a, a tournament angler. He's been a repeat guest on the Sonar Masterclasses before. So, Paul, I'm going to bring you onto the screen, mate. Let's get this show on the road. We're going to hey, be talking Greg. about different types of structure. We're going to be talking about different species. You're going to walk us through some screenshots. And, of course, everybody's welcome to ask questions. So, folks, let's just start out as we're getting going. I see there's a few people putting some uh, comments there in the chat now. So let us know you can hear us. Tell us where you're coming from. Put in the chat there where you're listening from, where you're watching from. So, Terry, good day, Terry. Nice hey, Terry. to have you here. Terry's one of the regulars, of course. Uh, Paul, mate, you're in lockdown at the moment, so not doing a lot of fishing at the moment. No, not a lot. Um, the rods behind me aren't getting a lot of use uh, <laughs> over the last couple of months. Um, last time out, uh, we're fortunate enough to have a competition in mid-June, kind of in between lockdowns here in Melbourne. Um, so that was the last opportunity I've had to get out. So it's been been a rough couple of months and i'm really looking forward to some spring and summertime fishing hopefully so but yeah. um look always happy for a, you know a chat about fishing and and sonars and and everything else it's always a lot of fun so looking forward well, to the show you know if we if we can't fish at least we can talk about it mate and that's uh, it yeah our sympathy with all the victorians and the new south welsh are all in lockdown at the moment it's it's a tough time no doubt about it yeah um, there's, there's a few guys uh on the on the comments there coming in from from new south and yeah and all around vic so uh, in victoria we've got people from tasmania we've got people from uh, new zealand even so welcome everybody thank you for yeah. letting us know where you're coming from uh, michael there from gladson so we've got people from all over the east coast of australia and from across the ditch in new zealand so great to have your company paul tell us a little bit about what we're going to go through this evening um, we're going to go through a, a number of different examples of, um, you know, bottom contours, bottom structure. We're going to talk about um, sound of basics. We're going to talk about, um, you know, setups, settings, answer a lot of questions from our customers, <laughs> uh, from a lot from a lot of our um, users and people watching the show tonight around, you know, different settings. Um, we'll talk about when's when's it appropriate to use bait versus lures versus vibes. And what kind of situations and what are the, I guess, features and benefits of those and why you, you um, use one over the other. Um, and we use some, you know, Melbourne examples, given I am a, a Melbourne guy, there'll be quite a yeah. few watching um, who are Melbourne people. We'll talk about snapper and brim and estuary species, which are really transferable kind of information and knowledge all around the state and all around the country too. Yeah, excellent stuff. All right, now we've got um, Trent's just made a comment saying he's uh, he's got to put the bub to bed, but uh, he's got a bass comp in a tidal river on the weekend, so any tips in regard to finding bass schools would be much appreciated. We'll see what we can do there, mate. We'll keep that in mind. Have you got a slide that might help with that, Paul? Uh, I think we I think we might be able to use a couple of the structure, yeah. the T tree or T T line kind of structures, yeah. Um, yeah, as well as some of the drop offs with some of the biggest schools. Okay. Yep, yeah. Cool. All right, so I'm going to bring up the first of our slides in just a moment, sure. guys. Just remember, this whole session really revolves around you guys asking questions so that we can you know, help you with the information you need. So feel free to fire the questions through. If we don't answer them straight away, just um, rest assured there's this big stream of, of posts coming through on the side of our screen. So mm -hmm. we will get through. We'll try and go back to them if we don't see them straight away. Don't feel shy to go back and post them a second time. We won't get up yeah, to them all the months. Uh, we'd rather answer your questions than leave you hanging. So let's bring up the first of those screenshots, mate. And let's all right. Let's so we can see it a bit better. Perfect. So, and the other call out is um, a lot of well, these screenshots have been taken on a number of different units. So this one in particular is from a, a good friend, Dave Eccleston, who's back over in WA now. So thank you to Dave for a few of these. And they've been taken on a Lawrence Elite TI2 with a three-in-one active imaging transducer. Some of the others have been taken on HDS Lives, 
and some others have been taken on the new Elite FS unit. But all three units have been running the active imaging three-in-one transducer for all the, okay. all the screenshots. And if you guys have a look along the bottom or in the sides, you'll see some of the different, different settings that have been run for the various images. So that also gives you a good comparison of image quality versus range and um, the different depths that they've been taken in. But this this first one is a really good example of um, a, a really good sp uh, split screen that Dave's running. So he's running, he's down imaging his traditional sonar across the top, and then he's utilizing the full width of that bottom panel to run his side imaging. So he's got 16 meters either side. And what we're looking at is some really heavy, rocky, rubbly bottom mm. and quite big boulders. And on the left-hand side, you can see there's some gaps in amongst those boulders. And that's traditionally where a lot of those fish will be sitting, not on the hard bottom, but in amongst those gaps. And anywhere where that rock transitions to sand or mud is a really good place to start looking um, for species such as pinkies, salmon, flathead. They'll all be roaming that transition kind of um, area. Mm. Excellent. Now, we've got a few questions come up, so we're going to run through some of those, Paul, before we move on and uh, and try and keep up with them before Sounds they good. accumulate too quickly for us. So, <laughs> question here from uh, from Case Emma. Been trying soft plastics for months but haven't had any luck. Usually fish off a jetty in the lake. Any tips? Uh, it's, a, it's a broad question. We'll try and cover it really quickly. So, Case Emma, if you are fishing, say, an estuary, um, kind of situation if, if it's a estuarine lake and not a freshwater lake. Um, the types of species that I'd be trying to target off that jetty, assuming you're in relatively shallow water um, in that kind of half a metre to two metre depth, I'd be looking at species such as brim, whiting or flathead um, to roam in those areas. Um, and also feel free to, to drop in another comment if I'm, if I'm off the mark and if it's a freshwater kind of situation in that lake. Um, that you're that you're talking about or describing there, but what I, I'd be looking for is um, a number of different lures. I'd be looking at a, a soft plastic with a relatively kind of light jig head, so that that soft plastic gently flutters to the bottom, um, and that's really good on a variety of species that I mentioned there. Um, flathead will come along and grab those plastics on the drop. Yes, correct type of species, perfect. Um, I just saw your comment come through there, Case. Um, so you know. Things such as uh, species such as flathead, brim, um, even whiting of different um, varieties, yellowfin and King George at times in, in Melbourne will take soft plastic offerings on a, on a lightly weighted jig head. Um, the other one come summertime, uh, especially if you've got some weed beds in the area around that jetty, uh, so little surface lures are really popular in the estuary lakes. So lures such as the OSP bent minnow is a really uh, hot favourite all around the country. It's a little bit pricey, but the action, uh, which imitates a fleeing wounded kind of shrimp as it kicks um, along the surface and ducks under the water and comes back up, is just really irresistible to a number of species. So I'd be looking at, at you know a number of different lures, such as uh, little curl tail grubs, little paddle tails, um, surface lures, or even mid to deep diving little hard body lures that imitate a, uh, a little bait fish. Now, I'll tell you what I've done, guys, as well, because there's a really easy way to get more information of that type, is I've just shamelessly plugged Paul's YouTube channel. So in the chat box there, you'll see a link to Paul's channel. Don't go there now. We want you to stick around. But when you do go there, make sure you subscribe and you'll see lots of information of that kind come up. So hope that helped you out uh, with catching a few fish out of the lake. Let's go back and have a look at some questions coming up about uh, setting up a sonar. So let's have a, a look at some of those. Um, Shane's, well. Shane's question? No, Andrew's. Andrew's? So, Any 2D yeah. side view of snapper grazing in shallow water and squid? I think I've, I think I've included a squid one, actually, Andrew. So I think we should be good on the squid we one. Might, we might get lucky with that one. And Andrew, stick around because later on in the year, we've got uh, Lee Rayner coming on board to do a same masterclass, and he's going to focus on snapper. So you'll get that information. Yeah, from, perfect. From I was just going to say, unfortunately, I haven't got a lot of great examples. Um, I've switched computers recently, so it's been a little right. bit hard to uh, locate some of those snap ons from previous seasons. Yeah, yeah. So Jamie's just purchased a new HGS7. Well done. Good choice. Uh, I think the transducer is set wrong. Uh, HGS Elite. 
Yeah. Um, yep. Oh, I guess the, the, look, there'll be a couple of different um, models that you could be referring to there, but uh, the, the basics of transducer placement are relatively uh, transferable among different transducers as well as units. So, look, the key thing it really is if it's a, on a boat, what you're really looking for is um, running clean water or getting clean water underneath that transducer. That's really going to give you the best image quality. Um, and the other thing to, to be mindful of is the speed that you're traveling at when you are um, when you are sounding around. So I've, I've personally found on a number of different boats and, and hull kind of types and configurations that three to six kilometers per hour is probably the ideal speeds, any more than six. You start to get a little bit of whitewash and turbulence and maybe vibration coming off the engine and the and the hull itself that starts to cause a little bit of, um, I guess, perhaps interference depending on the setup. And any slower than three, um, I haven't found any kind of value in uh, idling around that slowly. You, you still will find fish and, and get a nice clean image, but I think at least three kilometres an hour is a nice cruisy speed, but also allows you to cover some distance and some ground at a reasonable pace and get good images. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of placement, as I said, you really want to have a nice, um, at least level with the bottom of the of the hull, and getting some nice clean water underneath that transducer, um, and even point that transducer down a little bit. You don't want it pointing up. You don't want it too straight, but down a couple of degrees is probably about ideal. So I don't know about five degrees, eight degrees. Hmm. And you'll find that you know all your transducers and the transducer mounting brackets. You know, they've got slots in them as well, so you can just loosen the, the screws, you can drop it down a centimetre. And sometimes dropping a transducer down one centimetre can make a huge difference, or lifting it up a centimetre, and as you say, angling it, depending on what speed you're going, and what, you know, what angle your boat sits at when it's up uh, and moving, you know, that can make a big difference too. So have a play around with, with those things. And if you get stuck, you know, get in touch with Lorance via their Facebook and they'll give you plenty of support. So Yeah, and, and the other one, the other really good YouTube uh, resource, rather, is, is YouTube. Not, yeah. not my channel for transducer placements, um, although we've done done a couple of videos over the years on um, on my channel. But, the, yeah, there's a lot of great resources out there to um, just, you know, Google or YouTube, um, you know, Lorance transducer placement video, something like that, um, some basic key terms like that, and you'll uh, definitely find what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. And I think that might have answered, hopefully, Peter's question as well, Peter Rudd, who uh, asked a similar question about transducer placement. If not, Peter... Um, post us another message. Yeah, if, and, so, and Adam's got one as well that's just come through as well. So Okay. Yep. So Shane's saying he's bought a boat that's got HDS Live 9 and 3D setup, wondering if it's worth having the 3D unit when he's got the live unit. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? Um, if if by live you're referring to active target, Shane, so the, the new, I guess, technology from Lorance where you're able to see fish in real time, I think... Having the combination of a active imaging three in one and the active target transducer, either on the front of the boat on a pole um, or on your electric motor, I think that's a really good setup. Um, I know a lot of people have previously run the 3D transducer on the back of the boat as your kind of traditional side imaging transducer, and that's provided some really good results. Personally, I, I've previously used the 3D technology on that 3D transducer and module on a previous boat. And um, while I saw some good opportunities with it around structure, out in the open, I didn't find a lot of great benefit to the 3D functionality personally. And so for me, just a straightforward, simple three-in-one active imaging transducer combination with any of the units that we discussed tonight, I think is a really good combination. And then if you can then pair that up with the active target live imaging capability, I think that's the perfect setup. Okay, cool. Uh, Kyle's got a question about um, comparing Active Target with Garmin LiveScope, um, whether the Active Target is going to get more fine-tuned settings. I'm yeah, not absolutely, Kyle. Yeah, yep. yeah so we're, we're always kind of chatting um, amongst amongst the group, amongst the, the Navico team around <laughs> um, feedback from the customers, from the users, looking at opportunities to improve our product and uh, take that next step. So absolutely, there'll be software updates um, in months to come and, and you know, over the next couple of years to keep improving that product. 
Good stuff. All right. So Adam's asking about whether the transducer is able to see ahead of your, your boat, ahead of the movement of the boat, or is it only seeing directly beneath the boat? It's generally directly beneath, Adam. Um, depending on the transducer, the mounting angle of it will depend on, I guess, the cone and the beam um, and how far it shoots down. So it all really comes down to the, the transducer type as some of them have a narrower beam than others. And then it will come down to the placement of your transducer, whether it's flat, whether it's pointing down or pointing up, will depend on which which way that um, that transducer shoots. But assuming that it's shooting, it's it's mounted straight underneath, or straight on the back of the boat, you're essentially shooting down. So it's not shooting forward. You can, you can assume that, <clears throat> say you're in a tiller steer boat. Uh, where's my tiller? There it is. <laughs> Say you're sitting there in a tiller, you're looking at your um, uh, sound screen and your transducers on the back of the boat. You can assume that if the angle is shooting down, it might be right underneath your bum essentially on that um, on that seat. That's as far forward as it will shoot, but assume that it just shoots straight down where you've just passed. Yep. A little bit depends on water depth as well. Obviously, it shoots a bit further forward depending on the depth. So That's right. The deeper it is, the, the more chance it will shoot forward. Yep. Yeah. So we've got a couple more questions. Uh, I might do one more and then we might shoot back over to some screenshots. Sure. So uh, Paul's asking, can we explain the purpose of manual mode on a HDS? When would you use it and how do you get the best out of it? Look, manual mode, um, the, the times that I use manual mode, Paul, personally, is um, when I want to increase the... the um, not the contrast, the sensitivity. So the times that I really want to get or see more clutter on the screen, um, I'll see if we've got an example as we go through this. And if I find one that I think is suitable, I'll, I'll talk about this again in manual mode and sensitivity. But um, I think this was really important in previous generations of units, but um, more, more and more these days in the HDS Live range and the Elite FS range, I've really gone to Auto Plus. So I just use Auto Plus 3, Auto Plus 4, Auto Plus 5. And I'll talk about why I prefer um, slightly cluttered screens versus some of those clearer images. Um, the, the additional sensitivity that you get either from a manual setting or Auto Plus, what it's doing is it's picking up a lot of the little partial arches or little partial um, rice grains on the screen that a lot of people will miss out on excuse me, that run um, auto or auto minus. Those people that prefer to have a nice clean screen, it's like, oh, I'm getting these great readings, but you're not finding fish. Um, and oftentimes all you're really getting an opportunity at is one or two fish that you've passed, for example, on your down imaging or your traditional sonar. And if, you're, if the fish hasn't swum through your beam or your beam hasn't passed that stationary fish, you're only going to get like a... a a third of it, whether it's the front or the fin area, and that's going to come up as a little tiny arch. And the more sensitivity you have, the more chance you have of getting that to display. Because if the unit thinks that you know you want auto minus four or auto minus five, it might think that that's a little bit of extra um, clutter in the water. Might think it's a jellyfish or a bit of weed, but not a solid enough object to show on the screen at that setting. So I like to have run my unit on manual and then bump up that sensitivity. So I'm seeing quite a bit of clutter, but I'm comfortable to differentiate between the noise and what's actually fish along the bottom third of the water column, as a lot of the species that I target, such as brim and snapper, predominantly sit in that bottom third. So anything above, I don't care about. It can be there on the screen, I'll just put up with it, but I'm seeing those partial arches that a lot of people are missing out on. Mm. All right, I did say I was going to bring up a screenshot next, but I will bring up one more question because it might be relevant to what you've just said. It might also be relevant to uh, some of the screenshots we've got. Do we have anything of a halo cline? If, if, I'm, not, if I'm correct, Keir, Duncan, is that like a thermocline? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, a different we'll kind of halo yeah. thermocline is it's where the fresh water is sitting on top of salt water. Yeah, so well, I should have a few examples right. in, in yeah. amongst that, yeah. Yeah. If you Especially know what a thermocline screens, looks like, I think. You know what a thermocline looks like on a sounder? It looks very similar to a halocline. So, yeah. Yep. All right, let's bring up another screenshot. 
All right. So this is one of the local met metro Melbourne rivers. Uh, so on the side imaging, on the left-hand side, so Dave here was hugging the bank quite close. So you can see his range is out 18 metres either side, um, but the river bank essentially is about 12 metres away from him. Right there where, Dave's, uh, where Greg's cursor is, rather. And on the right-hand side of the screen is a vehicle. <laughs> so <laughs> um, unfortunately, living close to Metro Melbourne, you do get some interesting structure such as cars. Um, and we've reported a couple of these over the years just in case anyone's gone missing or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if they're still there, if they've been looked at. Uh, but there's some of the interesting things that we can find in Metro Melbourne. And also the other thing that I'll quickly call out is on the right-hand side towards the bottom of that screen, you guys can see three little dots. So there's a couple, a little bit of rubble, but a couple of those could potentially be fish. And then towards the top right of that screen, there's a white dot up there as well. That's a good example of a fish sitting on the right-hand side on your side imaging, just off the bottom, throwing a little bit of a shadow. So those are the types of things that we look for. We've got a nice sandy, muddy bottom, and then we've just got a few little bits of structure and a couple of fish sitting here and there. Really easy to identify those fish. Put your cursor or your finger on that fish, hit the waypoint button. You know, if you've got it all connected up to your um, to your electric motor or to whatever to your other units, you can easily identify where that fish is and um, you know accurately cast and target that fish um, without kind of blindly casting. I guess it really saves you a lot of time and effort in um, in fishing smartly. I guess if that's the best way to describe it. Sounds almost unfair, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I think the the new active target technology is uh, yeah is that yep. next level again. Yep. Um, would you like to make a, a comment on how that side scan relates to the um, to the down scan image above? Uh, I'll see if this is. I think there might be some better examples. Better examples Greg, with through. some of the rubble. We've got one with a, a rocky point that comes up in the down scan, as well as on the side scan. So we'll talk about that one in a little bit. Um, this one in particular, heavily kind of timbered lake, and probably a good question or a good option to also discuss Trent's question from earlier around the BASCOMP in a tidal system. So don't know the exact, um, obviously, system that you're talking about, Trent, but, you know, some of the places that I've fished up north, um, such as Southwest Rocks um, and some of the bass fishing that we've done up there previously, some of the structures that we've targeted have been bridges. So bridge pylons have been really, really good for us in the past. Um, we've had sessions where we're, we're catching flathead and mulloway down deep and bass off the same pylons on surface lures in September, October. So um, while this particular, obviously, image shows a lot of timber, we can see a few little dots dotted in amongst that timber. I think this is a, a really good way of um, trying to locate schools, uh, depending on the system and time of year and where, and where those fish are. Uh, given bass moves so much with the salt and, and the fresh water and depending on the, I guess, the cycle in terms of their um, spawn, um, they they can be, you know, 50 kilometres upstream, 100 metres from the mouth. It really just depends on how much rain you've had. But using side imaging, um, looking for things such as uh, heavy timber to see if there's, they're really stacked in, in amongst that timber. What you're going to be looking for is those little white rice grains and just between the five and the ten on the left hand side and and a little bit up in that first tree there's just just a number of little white dots and that's all you're looking for as you're idling up and down the system looking for those fish sitting in amongst the timber um, running things such as you know weedless jig heads i think that's a, a really good safe way of um, seeing if those fish are in in amongst the timber and on practice days you know, we won't even strike in a lot of our tournaments. We'll, we'll be looking for those bites. You can generally kind of know you're either targeting brim, estuary perch, bass. If you get the bite, you, you generally know what it is um, in amongst that kind of structure. And the other one, as I mentioned, depending on the system, man-made structure is fantastic as well. Bridges, jetties, whatever you can find, they really do love those current breaks. Um, it's also a great source of, you know, shelter for them shade and uh, other 
other little fish and shrimp hanging around. So definitely worth a look depending on the system that you're in, mate. Mm, excellent. Uh, another example of a, of a vehicle here in Melbourne, heading down the other way. Do you want to say any more or will I move on to the next slide? No, I think we can fly through them. Okay. So this one here is a, a Metro Melbourne Mulloway um, about to attack a, a bit of bait. So this is typically what, what we're kind of looking for when there's a bit of bait in the system. Um, just small, small little balls. You're not looking for football-sized kind of fields of it, but this is a great example of your traditional sonar on the left, your down imaging with fish reveal on the right. So Dave, Dave had fish reveal switched on in this particular image, and that's what gives it that arch instead of like a little white rice grain that a lot of you might be uh, familiar with. And a lot of my screenshots, I've actually had fish reveal turned off, so I'm just going to be running a lot of the white rice grains in a lot of my screenshots. Cool. And it's, it's just a personal preference thing too. That's all I was going to say. There's absolutely no right or wrong. Um, but for me, I because I've got my traditional sonar set, um, I'll be able to see those arches, and then you know, on the um, on the down imaging, that's all right. On the down imaging, I'm just going for white rice grains. Okay, another one with some structure. So on the right hand side, we've got a, it's a relatively uh, narrow system too. You guys can see it's it's about twenty meters in width in in uh, in its kind of completeness. So Dave's running 16 meters aside on his range. And on the right hand side is a little uh, launching kind of facility and area and a little sunken three man canoe on the bottom with those three little holes that are quite visible. Um, so that's sitting there on the bottom and towards the top right hand, oh, top left hand side of the image, we've got some fish sitting on the left hand side on side imaging there as well. Cool. Yeah. Now we've got plenty of questions coming through, guys. We're not ignoring you. We will come back to them. So if you have questions, if they're relevant to what we're talking about, I'll try and bring them up. Otherwise, we'll come back around to them. So keep posting them, and we'll keep rattling yeah. through some slides for the moment. Yep, sounds good. Uh, this cool. one excites me, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start getting into some more, uh, some better fish kind of uh, examples over the next couple. So again, we've just got a nice big school of brim on the right-hand side of our side imaging. This is probably another one that we can start talking about in terms of interpretation of what's on our traditional down and our side. So mm -hmm. as you guys can see, we're coming off a, a shallow flat in about a metre, which drops off to two and a half. And if we look at the bottom of our side imaging, it also gives us that same kind of effect where we're starting off shallow and it starts to drop off. So that yellow line is is you essentially the boat or the kayak um, the dark black area in the middle is the water column underneath you so the bigger that is the deeper it is and the narrower or smaller the shallower it is essentially and you can play around with that by adjusting the range so the deeper the water you want to try and adjust your range to be maybe at least twice as deep three times as deep as the water so if i'm in 10 meters of water. I don't want to have my range set to eight or 18 rather. I want to have it out to about 25 or 30. So that way I've got 10 meters of my water column either side and then about 15 to 20 or 25 meters pushing out to the sides. And I find that that's kind of the most productive. That's a good cast length, but also has really good quality. As you start to push out from 30, 40 meters, you'll start to drop off that image quality. So I think 30 to 35 is ideal, and any more the, the quality will start to drop off a little bit, depending on the transducer placement. Okay. Okay, we've got another one here. So we've got, we've got fish everywhere now. We've got fish underneath, we've got fish out to the sides. And uh, this is probably a, one of the better examples of um, of going quite slowly. So this is essentially drifting or barely moving and we start to get a little bit of blur. I'll have some better examples of me being completely stationary 
in one of the Gippsland systems from an, a competition earlier this year in the kayak. And you guys will see it's quite blurry, but it's a great example of a school of fish moving to my left. Um, but this is an, an example of what a school looks like when you're traveling really slowly or stationary just about. Uh, don't see the backup on the side imaging. Local flat, so ALF from YouTube. So I think I think side imaging is still super useful in this example, mate. I'm not obviously without more context around um, the type of species that are in that area. It's hard to know. Um, look, a lot of the local flats for us here in Melbourne, for example, will only hold species such as flathead or uh, King George Whiting, which really hang nice and low to the bottom and are often quite hard to pick up. So a lot of those areas, you just have to kind of fish. Um, what I use my side imaging for is to try and find any opportunities to see little drop-offs or rises or little bits of um, gravelly bottom or a little uh, weed patch. And I'll, I'll focus around that because again, those those little bits of structure in amongst open mud or flat draw those fish in. That's what they. That's the area that they'll start to congregate around. I, I guess the other observation I'd make, Paul, this is unrelated to what Alf's asked, but if you look at this side imaging image, what you're mostly seeing there, the first thing that catches your eye is actually the shadow of the fish. Mm. Not the fish themselves, where where you're looking over the over the flats, that's right. They're easy to see underneath the boat, but it's a good example of how the shadows can be useful, and it can give you an idea of how high the fish are up at the bottom as well, and that kind of thing. So, yes, yeah, spot on, Greg. Yep, absolutely. And um, I think coming back to the first two images of your traditional sonar, and you're down, you're you're in three meters, and but you've got fish stacked all the way up to a meter and a half. So, yeah. They're really all the way through that water column and assuming the, I've got a school five or ten metres out, again, they're, you know, a metre and a half off the bottom, they're throwing that shadow likewise. So Yeah. So some of these dots we're seeing here, those shadows might actually be these fish up that's here. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is one one that includes a thermocline. So the top two, so at the two point one, two point two meter mark. So above that, everything's fresh. Underneath 2.2, that's a salt wedge that we've got um, and a couple of big mull away. So I can't remember if this was the Patterson River in Melbourne or over at um, the Glenelg River at Nelson. So one of the two systems, but um, both very kind of prone to getting some dirty water after rains, getting that thermocline, pushing those mull away, um, big brim, big perch into certain holes where they find that right balance of salinity that they're happy in. Hmm. But um, for a lot of our units, this is what a thermocline looks like. Um, it's nice and easy to kind of see. It's just essentially a line um, somewhere in the water column. Yeah. So actually, I don't want to correct you, but, <laughs> but actually this is we had the earlier question about a halocline. A halocline. We distinguish between a thermocline and a halocline. So a thermocline is where there's a change in temperature. So the water density ah, changes. Oh, because of the temperature here we what we've got is salt water beneath so the water the density changed because of salinity so halocline and thermocline in terms of what they look like on your sounder they're both exactly the same um i guess the distinction is that you know if you're fishing lakes and things particularly late summer and through autumn beneath the thermocline it can become devoid of oxygen so there may be no fish there at all this is obviously a halocline because there are fish there so there's oxygenated water underneath. I'm just getting, I'm putting my scientist hat on, mate. I was so. going to say, so you, I've, I've learned something there. Perfect. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> that. All right. Well, let's jump over. We've got a whole bunch of questions, mate. Let's um, let's kill off the um, kill off the slideshow for the moment and bring a couple of these questions up and, and answer some of those. So uh, Mark's asking about uh, 3D transducers for side and down, down imaging. Um, mm -hmm. I'll let you read that, Paul, rather than me read it out. Uh, there's a, I know it's set to, so the, the three, so Mark, that 3D transducer, you should be able to select 455 or 800 on that unit as well off the top of my head. Um, I haven't used it in a number of years, but there should be an option on that right hand side menu for both your down imaging and your side imaging to be able to select or toggle between the different frequencies for your, um, yeah, side imaging or down imaging. Um, so I'd, I'd double check that menu um, 
for both down and side and see if you can. So you should be able to. Um, the other the other thing I guess we'll note throughout some of these screens, so that last one with a couple of those mole away, my side imaging was actually set to 455. And some of those previous examples that Dave has had have been on 800. So um, yeah, it's I guess it's a, a good opportunity after software update, only 455 available. Okay, that's an interesting one. We might have to take that one offline, Mark. Um, maybe reach out, if you don't mind, send me a message on Facebook, whether on my personal or on my fishing page, Paul Mallow Fishing, and we'll try and resolve that one, see if there's anything around that um, 3D transducer software update that's kind of locked that into 455, or if that was a decision that was made for the product. So I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, but again, sorry, so coming back to your question really quickly, look, sometimes it does make a difference, but I've actually found that I found myself using 455 a lot more um, to get that reach of 30, 35 metres aside, predominantly on my kayak. Um, Dad and I use it in the in the tinny. We've got a Quintrex 460 uh, Renegade. So it's a, it's a boat that a lot of people all around Australia run. Um, it's very familiar to everyone with the same setup. Um, and w oftentimes we run 455 and get great image quality, get good reach, and um, don't think I'm missing much from 800. But then other times in different water conditions, different setups, uh, people get good examples and good image quality on 800 as well. So it really comes down to personal preference and what you're really looking for. But I think, yeah, let's take that particular question offline and see if there's a, a decision made on 455 versus 800 for the 3D structure scan. Cool. And Ian, okay, so that one, side imaging, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, I, <laughs> okay. I I'll come back before. to that one. I, I normally get to them as well. So I th <laughs> Ian, think of side imaging as someone grabbing a torch and shining a light underwater. So you're not really affected too much by conditions. Um, depending on the water depth especially, if, you, if it's a relatively deep kind of area, three to five, six metres, think of it as shining a torch on an object and then that's going to, throw a shadow behind it if you are in that kind of 0.5 to 2 meter mark and it's really clear and it's sunny versus overcast you might get a slight improvement on the side imaging um, but it's not a significant one got to remember that sonar works on sound rather than light as well so let me go back to the previous one that i brought yes. up who do we have? Was that Ryan's? So Ryan's asking, he's bought a second-hand boat with HDS 9 carbon. Would like to add a second screen. What's the best option? It really new comes live. down to Cape Year, a new live or an FS model, and you have to add the same model. You don't have to add the same model, Ryan. So you can go to one of those two units. It really just comes down to capabilities that you want out of your unit. So a live unit just gives you that full-blown integration options that you, you know, whether you want to do engine, radar, the whole whole box and dice, whereas the Elite FS is more of a kind of mid-range unit, but with the active target capabilities. So mm. really just need the NMEA and Ethernet networking capabilities for the two units uh, to, to kind of talk and, and share waypoints and, and things like that. Um, and it really comes down to the size that you're looking for. So if you're looking for a unit that's bigger than nine inches, you're gonna have to go to the HDS Live series as the Elite FSs only come in the seven and nine inch unit. Um, personally, I find, or I think the Elite FS nine inch is probably the best bang for buck unit on the market right now. With the inbuilt, inbuilt mapping capabilities um, through CMAP, through Genesis, um, with the active target capability of that Elite FS, I think for 1500 bucks, you just cannot beat that unit. Um, that would be my pick of the pick of the bunch. Yep. So a question from Mick. He's new on the Hobie scene. Would you recommend sticking to Sonar only for, a fair, for the first few sessions? Hey, Mick. So, so it's a, if you could drop in a couple more kind of comments or give us a little bit more context around this, but... A, if you're talking about getting comfortable with the kayak, depending on the model, depending on your kind of you know physical abilities, um, I found when I first got into the Hobie kayak side of things, so for those that aren't aware, Hobie kayaks are a pedal-powered kayak. 
So you're essentially hands-free, you're pedaling like you would um, on a Stairmaster kind of um, exercise. And what you're doing is you're, you're holding a rudder um, with your left or right hand, depending on the model. So essentially, you know, it's quite easy to maneuver and steer. Um, they're very stable craft. So you're able to stand up, have a cast, look around, do whatever you need to do. So if, if you're talking about getting into Hobie fishing or kayak fishing in general, I think um, I think one session is a really good idea to just to go out and not take any rods with you and have a play around with your sonar and sounder and get familiar with what you're seeing. Um, I think it's also a really good opportunity to do some recovery exercises. Um, so this one's a little bit off track or, you know, not something that we really wanted to talk about, but I think it's a really important one when we're talking about safety and people being comfortable getting back in. So it's a really good opportunity to not even have your sounder obviously attached because what the goal is is to flip your vessel essentially, turn it upright and then try and get back in. And the goal is to do it in a safe environment where it's relatively shallow. You can stand up if you need to, but try and simulate or replicate a typical day's fishing. What, what are you going to be wearing? Um, you know, make sure your life vest works. Make sure that your boots don't kind of fill up with water and you, you suddenly realise, oh, I'm going to sink to the bottom. So try and have a play um, on a nice, warm, calm, sunny day in some shallow water. Try and replicate that scenario and then... As you get more comfortable and familiar with your particular vessel, get those rods out and um, yeah, get out there and start fishing. But I think it's a really good idea. Spend a couple of hours, play around with a sonar, have a look at you know places that have a lot of man-made structure. That's the easiest way to kind of fine-tune your unit. You know, go through a bridge. What am I looking at? We've got a couple of examples. Yeah. Look near the boat ramp. What does my boat ramp look like? What does the edge of the concrete block look like? What does the drop-off look like? Um, I can visually see a um, a rock bar. You know, what does that look like on my sounder? And go through that exercise a couple of times and then get back onto land, take that sounder off, go through that um, that exercise of turning over and recovering, and then next time out, you'll be good to go. All right. I think we've nearly caught up on all the questions, guys. If we've missed any, as I said earlier on, just post them again or... Yeah, point point out that we've missed and we'll make sure that we get back to any questions that haven't been answered. Yep. So, well, let's get back to our slideshow. Tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here. Yeah, so this one in particular, again, running 455 along the, uh, the side imaging and down imaging here in terms of our frequency. And uh, what we've got is a, a relatively deep kind of area. It's 10 degrees water temperature. So you... You know we're fishing down south and uh, in the middle of winter. <laughs> it's it's pretty cold. Coming to the bottom of the image on the right-hand side, you guys can see it's quite blurry at the very bottom. So this is where we were relatively stationary and then we started to slowly pick up speed. So that image starts to really just clear up. Everything starts to become really crisp. But what we've got where that dark area is, is just a lot of gravelly, rubbly bottom on the right-hand side of the image at 15 to 23 metres. And then that starts to clear up and that becomes a little bit less sparse towards the top. Um, also having a look at our speed. So our speed at this point in time we've taken the screenshot is only two knots, so about three and a half kilometres. So that started to give me that nice clean image along the side imaging, as well as giving me those arches and those little white rice grains and fish reveal. So we've got a bit of a drop off, got a big school of fish sitting there. And I think the next image shows the continuation of that. Yeah, so it starts to drop off even further and that's school, so it's just a, a really big school stacked up. In terms of um, look, talking about fishing for a moment, Examples like this in a lot of kind of estuary systems here in Victoria, especially, I find a really low percentage. Um, they also tend to hold a lot of the smaller fish. So when I see images like this, while it looks great, generally speaking, a lot of these fish will be unsized, talking about brim or estuary perch. And the other aspect or the other element is they're often really hard to catch. They're often quite shut down. So these are not the types of schools that I'm looking for when I'm actively looking for fish. Um, and you can even kind of tell from the from the size of those dots on the screen that they're relatively small. 
it's, it's worthwhile having a couple of casts, especially on the outside of the schools, try and locate the start or the end or the edges a little bit closer and shallower to the banks. But I really don't spend a lot of time fishing in any deeper than four to five metres, generally speaking. Well, that's easy. Yes, yeah, so we've got a, <laughs> got a lot of timber in this one. Mm. Um, got a few fish sitting in amongst that timber. Just a really good example again. Um, yeah, just what what it looks like, what heavy heavy timber looks like on the um, on the live units with a three in one on four fifty five kilohertz at uh, yeah twenty meters per side. Um, I might just quickly pick up Mick's question while we were talking to him earlier as well, if that's all right. Thank you, Greg. So searching for Mulloway in four metres of water, would you be searching for more bait fish or Mulloway archers? Um, the answer is probably both, Mick. Um, a lot of times, yeah, I mean, they, they're they not too far behind, generally speaking. So if I'm in four metres and there's no visible kind of structure or um any structure nearby, I'll be probably increasing my range as far as possible. So I'll try and cover as much ground as I can in that particular scenario. So I'll push my range out to 35 or 40 metres aside and um, really kind of maybe even increase my contrast a little bit to so make sure things are a little bit more lit up on the outer edges of that um, screen. Um, but if there are, if there is structure in the area, then I'll start to look for specific fish in amongst the structure. If I'm out in the open, I'll look for bait fish. If I'm around structure, I'll try and identify the structure that's holding those mole away. Mm. Always worth putting in a few casts whenever you find bait, you know, because just because you can't see a fish on the on the sounder doesn't mean there's not one. Exactly. You can you can draw them in from a couple of meters away easily. Yep. Yep. Um, Paul, just quickly uh, looking at the fish reveal on the right hand side at the top there. Yeah, that would that would indicate that a lot of these arches that you're seeing on the left hand side are fish. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, look, yeah, typically speaking, Greg, that that is correct. Um, the units are very smart in in the way that they interpret um, the readings and what's coming back um, through that transducer and the beam and and what's coming back and displayed. Um, this is one of the earlier ones, I guess, when fish reveal first came out. And again, as I said. I've now switched that option off and I'm just looking visually to look for those little white rice grains in amongst the timber. Um, the software is really good, but it's not always perfect. So some of those towards the right hand side of both the traditional sonar and down imaging with a couple of arches are a little bit dubious to me. So yep. just because it's right smack bang on a couple of the um, tree stumps, I guess, um, it's not enough of a differentiator for me to, to really see that there's fish in there. So again, just a personal preference thing. I've turned them off myself, but I know a lot of people are, are still running them and have really good success with it. As I said, the software and the, the technology is, is that good these days. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's why I asked the question, because to me, some of those look a bit dubious as well. Yeah. Um, Mark's got a question I might bring up as well while we're on this particular slide. And yeah. his question's about the color palette for side and down imaging. Yeah. It, Again, comes down to personal preference, Mark. Um, some are better in the daytime than nighttime. The majority of my fishing is either low light mornings or um, up until about, you know, two, three o'clock in the afternoons during that kind of peak high sun time. And I found colour palette number one and colour palette number six to be my personal preferences. I find that they really show and contrast the difference between a rock and a fish um, quite well. And um, it's just something that I've become used to. It's also not too bright and too flashy. Um, I don't like any of the fluoro colors, like the green, bright greens and bright reds and things like that. While they, they're they often a lot better at nighttime too, though. That's just that difference and contrast is a little bit easier on the eyes in the night. All right, let's move on. All right, so this one is a, an example of one of the local bridges here in, in Melbourne. Um, so there's quite a bit to take in on the side imaging. So Absolutely. the first thing that you guys will notice is, yeah, perfect. Thank you, Greg. What first thing you guys will probably notice is those black lines 
And uh, what they are is a shadow of the concrete columns and, and pillars um, underneath the water of the of the bridge pilings, essentially. Um, so quite you know quite long and, and tall um, objects underneath. Um, and uh, on both sides, we've got a mixture of rock and timber. So predominantly rock on the right hand side, and a mixture of timber and rock on the left. And towards, as we go past the bridge on the left hand side, towards the very top at around the 15 meter mark, you can see a couple of white dots. And those are, that's what I'd be looking for when I'm targeting brim and estuary perch in the local systems. Um, and that's the area that I'll be focusing on. The other, the other area to look at is the very first pylon on the right, on the bottom, just behind it to the right. Uh, keep going all the way out to about 23 meters, Greg, for me. And yeah, keep going down, 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 and there we go. So that little white dot is a perfect example of a fish using that last column or last pylon to sit behind, get out of the current, um, wait for that food to come down, have a bit of a feed around on the oysters, on the mussels around that pylon, um, and yeah, save a bit of energy. So hitting, targeting pylons is a great way in the estuary systems. Cool. So a question from Nathan about um, upgrading a 7Ti to 9FS. Yeah. It's really so, much better for clarity. Yeah. So, Nathan, I, I went through the same exercise. I went from a – I've had the 7Ti, I've had the 9Ti, 9Ti2, and I went to the 9FS, and it is it is a lot better, mate. Um, clarity, especially in the direct sunlight, especially in a, in a tinny or a hobie or a kayak, rather. Um, I think it does make a, a big difference. Um, it's just a, a much better, better overall kind of screen and unit on the whole. I think it's a really worthwhile upgrade. What's the cheapest unit with three in one capabilities for someone on a budget? So, Caden, I'd probably try and get your hands on an Elite TI2, a second hand one. So, there's there's a lot of people that are either operating from an Elite TI or an Elite TI2 to the Elite FS units. Um, and a seven or a nine inch unit. I've seen TI two nines going for around the six hundred dollar mark um, used with pretty much everything, including that three in one active imaging transducer. So um, that bang for buck, I'd be keeping an eye out on some of the Facebook groups or forums or buy swap and sell pages, um, and that's where I'd be picking up. Yep. And a, a shameless plug: my my old Elite Ti2 will be will be for sale at some stage over the next couple of months <laughs> when I can finally get over to Scott Lovig Hobie in Mornington. Or if you want it, you guys can get in touch with those guys, and I think they've still got it. <laughs> All right, <laughs> what have we got here, Paul? Uh, so here on the left hand side of our side imaging image is a uh, you guys can see I've kind of marked it in red, We've got a bit of an arc there, but the, the straight white line is the bottom or the end of a concrete ramp. So that, that I guess that section, that's probably about two, two and a half metres in width, that's the concrete ramp that runs from about uh, 12 metres all the way out to the side. And then that bright white line is the edge of that concrete ramp as it drops off. And then I guess around it, we've just got some ru rubbly, rock crushed rock um and on the right hand side we've got a couple of um indentations where the the dark shadows are yep so thank you greg um little divots little um, indentations and a couple of those white rice grains on the side imaging are brim estuary perch mullet so that's again a really good example of what we look for uh, when we're targeting these these species in estuary systems um, there'll also be some screenshots where it's it's quite clear that there's fish out there, but this is a good example of ones and twos. And also, if you were to go over one of those fish, as I said, with your traditional sonar and talking about manual mode or high sensitivity, that's the kind of thing that you pick up on if you've only got traditional sonar or down imaging uh, by using the manual or um, increased sensitivity when you're looking for only singles or doubles at, at most depending on, yeah, the situation that you're in and the amount of fish in the area. Cool. We've got a couple of questions I'll bring up here. Sure. 
So Austin Locks asking, would there be any performance advantage in running an MR? Five high wide in conjunction. Performance advantage. High wide. Depending on so Austin Lock, depending on the on the situation and what you're fishing for, I guess. Look the the Let's three in one is, you, a, is a great oh, fishing in port <laughs> for, for snap for snapper perfect. Thank you, Greg. Um, that was a great follow up to that. So you you may yeah you may, you may get an advantage in water depth deeper than say ten to fifteen out on the mud out on those outer reefs um, down towards the towards the heads you might see an advantage. Um, but that three in one Austin is going to be fantastic for the majority of Port Phillip, like Black Rocks and Kilda, Williamstown, Altona. Like it just does it all. You'll easily a find those fish on the side imaging around Princess Pier. You know, one of one of my best fish that I think Greg and I have spoken about previously when we've talked about snapper. It was about six and a half kilograms. I found it on the side imaging, just sitting there stationary, and just had a couple of lines start to come through and. Threw out a little plastic 10 metres to the side and six and a half kilogram snapper 20 minutes later. Um, but that three in one is such a powerful transducer in, you know, 10, 20, 25 metres of water. Um, you might get an advantage in that deeper water, but not by much. Well, that brings us to another question that's come up whether you'd recommend the uh, 7Ti and 9FS for. I think the 7Ti is starting to. I think the 7Ti is starting to push it at 100. I think the 9FS is a little bit more powerful off the top of my head, Dermot. Um, what I would suggest on that is changing your traditional sonar frequency to 50 kilohertz instead of 200. Um, the down imaging and side imaging will struggle at 100 metres. It's, it's not what it was designed for. It was more of a shallow water application. So your traditional sonar, which is that screen on the left hand top left hand side of this image, is your traditional sonar, and that's what I would be running in 100 meters of water. I'd be running the traditional sonar on a one of the lower frequencies, which will, and uh, perhaps even look at slowing down my ping speed, <clears throat> um, which essentially allows the signal to hit the bottom, come back up, let the unit receive that message and what it's seeing and then send down another one. Um, what often happens in deep water is people still have their settings set to traditional kind of estuary or shallow water settings. And what's happening is when you set your ping speed to max, you get really good image quality as the, as the sonar beam keeps shooting quite very quickly, very often. What happens in deep water is it shoots down but hasn't had an opportunity to come back up off the bottom and more signals keep hitting it. And so you start to get dropouts in your image quality. You don't get that consistent kind of bottom structure. So what you want to do is, yeah, increase your, or drop your frequency down to about 50 kilohertz or 83 kilohertz and decrease that ping speed from say max down to about 14, maybe 12, depending on the depth and see what that does to your image quality. See what happens to the returns, see what you're starting to, what you're seeing on the screen and adjust it from there. If you feel like the screen's gone too slow, you're getting great quality, bump up that speed until it gets to a point where you start to blow out again and then just back it off a little bit. And that would be my kind of sweet spot. So I think the unit is capable, but I don't think the side imaging technology is suitable for 100 metres. All right, let's move on to another slide. <laughs> this one looks pretty cool. So yeah, we've got a couple of things to look at on this particular one. Starting at the bottom of our side imaging screen, as we kind of travel and progress, we've got this little couple of divots. So you guys can see that as the, I guess the depth changes. So on the right hand side, we've got a nice shallow flat with a couple of fish on it, drops off a little bit. We've got that arc, which I've marked. And that's a, a rocky kind of reefy, bouldery area. Um, as we keep going, um, we start to kind of come up in depth, starting to see fish directly underneath us and on the right-hand side on the side imaging screen. And uh, the left-hand side, we're seeing a few fish, a couple of uh, depth changes. So we've got that first depth change um, marked by the shadow. 
So as we've talked about, you know, you can't, can't, you think of side imaging as shining a torch or a flashlight onto an object and it can't look kind of behind an object or at something that it can't see. So that's where the shadows come from. So it's looking, shooting straight across, but as it drops off, there's a bit of a shadow. That's a really good kind of giveaway to see that there's, yeah, perfect, Greg, thank you. Where Greg's cursor is, is that little drop off. And yep. then another rise a little bit further up as well. Yeah. So yep. some, some nice different kind of uh, depth changes in the area. Again, similar, that's just a continuation going a little bit further. So the school's really starting to pick up and stack up. And um, a lot of the, I guess, the brim anglers or uh, estuary people will start to notice the depth. So as I've talked about previously, I, I don't generally fish any deeper than five. And a lot of these fish really do like that two to three and a half, four metre mark um, and consistently stack up in that kind of zone, <clears throat> especially in the winter time. Yeah, so getting some good readings. There's just schools. There's just hundreds of fish all around us now, um, directly underneath and on the side imaging, both left and right. And it, it, you guys might be able to kind of tell that there's a visual difference. You can see those bigger fish on the screen. You can see where the smaller ones are and those bigger bigger dots, there are bigger fish. They're the kilogram brim. They're the 1.5s that you really want to try and target. So, again, oh, it gives you... Yeah, and the one on the right-hand side, just as it starts to go a little bit darker, um, at about that 17-metre mark, halfway along, a bit up, up, uh, yeah, that guy. That's what I'd be trying to target. <laughs> exactly. All right. Uh, similar, we've just got a, a colour palette change. This is back to uh, palette 9, not palette 1, in this particular example. Um Let's see, who was it? It was also Mark. So, Mark, you, you'd notice that a lot of these screens are running in 455. So we've got good range, good image clarity, we're finding fish, we're finding structure. So um, no issues with 455 over 800. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, colour palette, we kind of talked about personal preference and time of day. I find that that's um, but one, six, and nine, actually. So number one's got that slightly greeny tinge to it. And just looking at the at the down scan scan there, mate, that's showing that this, you know, the fish, a lot of the fish are well up off the bottom. Is that, you know, for your style of fishing into your mind, is that telling you that the fish are a bit active and and potentially feeding, or is is there something else going on there? Yeah, it it really depends, Greg. Um, Every every trip out tends to be different for us, especially you know on the on the brim side of things or, or tournaments or whatever we might be doing. So it's just a matter of giving them a go, giving a particular school a go, and um, it might also indicate to us what what lure or um, what technique might be best in a particular situation. So if those fish are sitting a little bit off the bottom, aren't kind of mooching and, and head down, bum up in the mud or sand looking for those little nippers or worms or crabs um, and sitting a little bit more suspended looking or chasing those little bait fish um, might indicate to me that, you know, I want a, a, a lighter jig head um, or a lightly weighted plastic as so it, it spends more time in that water column instead of uh, yep. sinking directly to the bottom. Right down. Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, gotcha. Running things such as a suspending hard body jerk bait lure or um, a slow sinking stick bait which just flutters through the water column, which is another yep. great um, alternative to a soft plastic. Yep, cool. So Michael's asking on the side imaging, can fish show just a shadow without showing a white streak, e.g. barrow over a flat? Typically not, Mike. Um, typically you should still, that white streak should be around there somewhere. It might kind of coincide with one of the edges, whether it's the bottom where the, um, water column meets the bottom might be there or um, the contrast of it might just kind of blend it a little bit more with that particular colour palette but generally speaking you should be able to pick it up somewhere. Interestingly and this is completely unrelated but but it's just interesting talking about barrows that I was talking to Steve Morgan recently he was saying that when Barramundi swims straight towards the active target um, transducer that because of the shape of the head they can actually reflect 
the uh, the transducer signal and they can disappear from the sounder for a, for a period of time and you think they've gone but yeah, right. still there. so there you go that's just, that's a bit of trivia for you sound of trivia <laughs> <laughs> terry's got a question for us uh, on your traditional and down scan are you setting the depth to a, a particular level or are you just leaving it on auto uh generally leaving it on auto these days terry yeah, unless I'm fishing super shallow, then I might set it manually to something like two metres. Yep, or perhaps super deep. If you're looking for demersal species, you might cut out the surface stuff. And yeah, that's very true. The bottom. Do like a yep. bottom zoom kind of, yeah. Yep, okay. Let's move on to another slide. Okay, just more examples. Uh, got, yeah, fish showing either side, good schools. Got a really concentrated patch there. They look relatively small, but that... That one on the traditional sonar and down imaging towards the right hand side is looking nice and nice and juicy. This one yeah, that's here. the one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's that's kind of the thing that I'd be targeting, having a cast back behind the boat, mm -hmm. turning the boat around, having a couple of casts and seeing yeah. if we can pick that one up. Uh, we've got a drop off underneath the boat directly. We've got a couple of different um, variations in depth on our left-hand side side imaging screen there. The right-hand side is relatively flat. Um, it, now, you, you're picking the different or the drop-off in the bottom depth by the widening of the... Of, of this, uh, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the width of our um, uh, water column directly beneath the boat, but it's also really? visible on the on the two images above. Of course, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, and these dark lines, they're, they're the ridges or the backsides of the ridges that you... you yeah, that's right. And the other thing I guess we want to call out is a lot of these examples are predominantly like a muddy bottom. We've got a really good example to demonstrate sand and mud all on the one screen. So the left-hand side um, in one of these images a little bit later shows you a great example of sand formation through kind of natural tides and what mud looks like on the right-hand side. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to bring up a, a question from uh, Extreme Armchair Angler. I was wondering when he was going to pipe up. I knew he'd be there somewhere. <laughs> so where are the fish or structure that you see on the screen in relation to the transponder and where do I cast? I normally cast from the front deck, so are the fish I see on the screen actually behind me? Great yes, question, they are. Bob. Yes. So great example, John. So... At the very top of that side imaging screen is where you are at this point in time when I took this screenshot. So everything kind of beneath or below is historical or past the boat. So I guess that often the easiest way is either setting waypoints that we discussed earlier. So by putting your cursor or your finger with a touchscreen unit onto a particular piece of structure or fish, marking it on your um, map map screen or your GPS, or alternatively being quite active and ready with a rod in hand to make a cast when you see a piece of structure or a fish that looks really good to you by either literally throwing it over the back of the shoulder or pointing, turning the boat around on an electric or on the outboard and making some casts at that particular piece of structure or fish that you're, uh, you know, you found an interest in. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, the other thing you could do, of course, is you could reverse up the river and just be always ahead of your, uh, or always behind your sounder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we need to say any more about that slide? We move. No, on I think that time. one's that one's pretty yeah. self-explanatory. Oh, Again, this looks like crop circles. We, we've had some good good fish patches over the years. Yeah, so we've got a, a nice big school on the right hand side, and uh, a little bit less on the left, but we've got this. Yeah. Uh, a great example of a couple of different kind of depth variations and a, a bit of a, a deep hole, but also shows that, you know, the majority of fish are sitting on the on the flat um, flat mud on the right-hand side and aren't really showing a lot of interest in that depth variation for whatever reason in this particular example. Got a good question come up from Kia. I'm just going to bring that up. More transducers, but to scan forward inside. So, Kia, one of the... The, the technology essentially already exists with the Lorance Active Target capabilities. So the Active Target module and transducer allows you to mount a transducer in three different ways. So you're able to essentially look forward in a scanning kind of mode, 
look uh, oh sorry there's the scanning there's a forward mode and then there's a down mode um, and it's the the scan and the forward modes that allow you to look ahead of the vessel um, or your craft uh, by either mounting it to a pole or to your electric motor and I think um, uh, that's something that I'm, I'm most excited about with these lockdowns. I've, I've had the technology sitting and just haven't had an opportunity to install it and get out there and use it. So it's something that I'm, I'm really excited about. I think it's going to change the way that I fish for, for brim and a number of other species such as snapper and mulloway here in Melbourne. Um, I think it's, it's definitely changed the way that uh, people fish for cod, people fish for barramundi, um, for bass, and I think it's us southerners are probably one of the late adopters to the technology um, on on the brim but i think there's going to be some great advantages to it but the we technology help, already exists yeah we can't help but think that it's also going to be a great tool for malawi fall it's uh it, it just has all the hallmarks of being a useful tool yeah some yeah probably not a not a good thing sometimes given the <laughs> uh, the decline in numbers in some of the states that's true uh, that's true as, as long as we do a little bit of catch and release and, and do our bit um yeah that yep. should be okay yeah i agree so this particular example is a great one where the rock bar on the left on that side imaging essentially pierces the the bottom in a way and and we can see that that rock starting to come through on the down imaging screen on the top right. So about two thirds of the way. I uh, keep going a little bit for me, Greg, to the right, and that's it. And so underneath, even underneath the um, the bottom, that's it. So that's that's showing you the top of that rock and what that looks like on the site imaging as well as your down imaging screen. Mm. So just a just thought that was a, a neat little picture there. It's almost like a lava slide, that one. It is, yeah, exactly. And now we come to our sand and mud example. So hmm. on the left-hand side is uh, the, the sand and, uh, you know, the, the, the natural formation <clears throat> and the way that it looks underwater. Um, if you've ever gone for a swim or gone for a dive, um, you'll see that that's the way that it kind of sits and uh, forms naturally, um, but also just shows you what it looks like on the, on the side imaging. And the mud, of course, being smoother, but having a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one's got a little bit of rock in amongst yeah, it as well. Got a few bits and pieces mixed yeah. in with it, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've got some really thick schools from memory. This was Gippsland Lakes. Um, we've got yeah, brim mixed in with Silver Trevally in this particular example off the top of my head. Um, not much more to say to that, but just oh. different colour palettes, different examples, <clears throat> not going very fast, so 0.6 of a knot. It's about a kilometre and a half, I guess. Hmm. Again, bigger school, got a bit of a, a separation there. And um, if, you know, if you're lucky to get onto the right patch, this is what snapper schools out in Port Phillip Bay will look like as well. So this example is me completely stationary in uh, one of the rivers in Gippsland Lakes. Um, on the left-hand side, I've just got a school of brim swimming past. So we've got those white lines and shadows being thrown. I'm quite shallow in a metre and a half and hugging the right-hand side bank as we're heading up river. So you can see that the, um, the bank is about six and a half, seven metres away from me. And then I've got the school on the left-hand side, which is a little bit deeper, where the river drops off, the fish are passing, so it just makes for quick, easy casts. But the image isn't clean, the image isn't pretty, but it's an example of what it, what they look like when you're stationary. So you can still see, you can still find fish. <clears throat> have confidence that you know what you're seeing is fish. You know what, the image doesn't have to be pretty as long as it gives you the information you need. So that's it. That's it. Um, this one's kind of uh, flipped around, so I'm hugging the left-hand side this time, about five metres off the bank, and then the school's now on my right-hand side on that drop-off in that slightly deeper one-and-a-half to two metres. Um, this particular example is on 800 kilohertz um, and not running the fish reveal technology on this one. <coughs> this is the same one. If I just jump back, there we go. <laughs> Uh, this particular image is of a couple of concrete blocks 
at the one of the gates in the Patterson Lakes uh, canal system here in Melbourne. So as you come through the gates um, on the right hand side of the side imaging, you can start to see like a ripple effect and that's the, the metal corrugated kind of washboards along the sides. And then you've got some big concrete blocks that are present on our traditional sonar and down imaging, as well as a, a big school of fish sitting in those drop-offs. Um, yeah, perfect, Greg, thank you, where Greg's cursor is. So again, just a, another example, it's not clean. We've got real uh, depth changes, We've got different structures under there. We've got a bit of rock, a bit of, you know, a bit of weed shown in the brown and greens, and we've got some fish stacked in amongst them. But if you just looked at the sonar image on the top left, you'd, you'd probably go a couple of those fish just above the time indicator. They're, they're probably fish and the rest isn't really clear, but by having the traditional sonar and down imaging side by side, gives you that full picture of what you're looking at. Yep, yep. <clears throat> very good. So John's asking if traditional sonar is historical and traditional transponders located on the stern, is there any advantage to placing a traditional three-in-one transponder on a pole and have it face forwards? So you can get it to work, John. The, the trick with the three-in-one, I guess, I don't know if trick's the right word, but to get the best out of your three-in-one, you really need to be moving at a, at a speed, one of those speeds that I kind of indicated. Generally speaking, you you only do those speeds when you're uh, searching for fish. When you're just moving um, relatively slowly and actively fishing, you're going to get a, a relatively washed out, blurry image and return. And that's where the the different frequency and the, the functionality and the module and uh, transducer of the active target really, I guess, is that next step forward instead of running the active imaging three in one the active target's gonna get you far better returns as well as being able to see fish swimming real time. I think that's the real advantage. A, you're gonna get a cleaner image, but you're also gonna be able to see how those fish react to your particular lure or presentation or retrieve or technique. And I think that's, that's the best tool for the job that you're talking about there. I think the active imaging three in one is best placed on the on the transom or the, or the stern um, and looking historically, showing you what's happening out to the sides and underneath you, and then um, utilizing the active target capabilities for uh, forward facing. Stuff, all right. Look, this is our very last slide, Paul. So let's, uh, let's knock this one over and then we'll just check yeah. and make sure we've answered all the questions, so. Perfect, perfect. Walk so, it through it. Yeah, so on the left-hand side, big, big school of brim sitting just on the bottom, just off the bottom by seeing some of those shadows. And on the right-hand side, I've, I've actually got a mixture of uh, weed and mud. So the first 10 metres of my right-hand side side imaging is a patch of weed. And then we've got this nice clear line of mud. In amongst the weed is a couple of white dots. So you, you definitely know that there's brim and estuary perch sitting in amongst those and luderick often. <clears throat> and then as we come across to about 17, 20, 23 metres on the right-hand side, that weed edge starts again. And uh, we can see a few more fish scattered throughout, but the predominant, I guess the, the majority of the fish really are sitting on the open mud on the left-hand side. I was over there, yep. Okay, so that's all of our slides, Paul. So we've got a, we've got a question from Reese as well. Too, yeah, we're going to bring our ugly mugs back and we'll just answer questions. So okay. how are we going, guys? Have we got any? Have we missed any questions? If we have, as I've said before, put them up again. And we'll make sure that we answer all of them before we uh, we finalise tonight's show. So Reese's question: Do you recommend sounding with the tide or against for best picture quality? I, I tend to sound against the tide. Um, race and um, it also just really assists with boat positioning um, and being able to get onto those fish and, and a lot of the times they will also sit with their noses into the current so by the time you either turn around or cast at them I found that it's a better presentation um, having to come back around and, and cast but 
I don't think it makes a great difference unless you're on a in a system where it's. Uh, I don't think it's made made a difference for me personally, to be honest. I think my readings with or without with or against Tide have been very similar, actually. I won't comment like on that question at all. I think it's pretty similar. It sounds like for you, it's more about how the fish are positioned and and how you present your your lure to them, rather than yeah. how you get a better image. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So question from Vincenzo, how do you avoid noise from the motor having the three in one located 30 to 40 centimeters to the right of the prop? My left so side Vincenzo, one good. of the, yeah, one of the techniques that we often use is trimming up actually. So it's not a, not a perfect solution for it. Um, but the placement of, as you said, the placement of the transducer on the transom, um, Essentially, what it's trying to do is it's trying to shoot through the side of the leg, and it just can't. It can't kind of go around it. And yeah, you guys would have seen on on some of the images, the left hand side might not be as crisp as the right hand side. Um, but what you can do is you can trim up that motor to about seventy percent. So you're not at the tilt function yet; you're still in trim. And what it creates is a gap between the transom and the outboard leg. So what you're trying to do is trim, 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 and you're trying to shoot. That, uh, that beam back across to the left-hand side of the boat. So we found that that really helps to clean up the image. Cool. And, and the other option is, depending on the um, hull that you've got, is to mount that transducer pretty much smack bang in the middle um, on the bottom side of the hull, depending on your trailer setup and where you kind of fish. Um, but that will give you the cleanest readings by far. Uh, but not the most user-friendly. Oftentimes, it's, it's a lot safer and easier just to transfer them out. All right. So Alf's got a question about using traditional sonar, colour palettes and distinguishing between weed, mud and rock. Uh, I wish I had... Yeah, I, I can, Alf, but off the top of my head, I forgot if I'm on 13 or 16 personally. <laughs> I think I'm on the last. I think I was on the last color palette for traditional sonar. I think it was 16. Apologies. Is it one of the slides? I think it's What's that, Greg? Is it one of the slides we've already been through? Do you want me to bring those up? No, again? I don't know. I don't know if I had that screen. We might. Yeah. See if we can quickly fly through them. <clears throat> but I don't think I had that side menu open on my settings for my traditional sonar. They all seem to be the uh, side imaging, or down imaging settings with 455. Sorry, Alf. Off the top of my head, Alf, I use the very last color palette available on the traditional sonar menu structure. And what that particular color palette allows me to do with the way that it displays um, the the results or the um, the image on sonar is it it's pretty much as you described it green it will show up green for weed so I know where my calamari beds and you know whiting beds and um, whatever else green is going to be green um, mud will come up as brown and um, rock off the top of my head it was like a yellow or red and that um, yeah that just kind of indicates to me that it's a solid hard bottom. But by using all three screens, I also get a really good view, or really good sense of what, what type of bottom structure is underneath and around me um, by utilising that split screen functionality. But off the top of my head, Alf, apologies, it's either 13 or 16, but it's the very last colour palette on the traditional sonar list. Um, and I think Reese, sorry, Greg, Reese just goes Western Port. I think he might have had a question early on around settings and maybe even um, water clarity or um, there was a question that I saw pop up around Western Port. <clears throat> Let me just scroll back through. Reese, if we haven't answered your question, mate, I'll get you to just put it up again and it'll come maybe up at I'm first. Imagining it. Oh, uh, yes, it was a race. Um, guys fishing dirty, weedy water in Western Port Bay with HDS 12. Any recommendations for colour line 
auto or manual best for clarity perfect sorry race i did say this one but we just kind of which had that many questions flying through at the same time <clears throat> so that particular question race in terms of color line i generally set mine around 78 percent and just leave it at that i think that's a really good um good setting for all around both bays. Um, a lot of my history stuff, I pretty much just don't touch that. That gives me a really good um, reading of mud, rock, etc. cetera. Um, with the Western Port, depending on obviously tide or the, the stage of the tide and how much rain we've recently had, it's more prone to getting a lot more, a lot more uh, turbulent kind of um, turbulent water, a lot more, sand weed jellyfish in the water i would i would generally run it in manual and then every trip out i would have to make adjustments on my sensitivity depending on the water clarity and it's going to change by a couple of percent every time unless we get some strong rains like we've recently had and so for example you know some days when it's really 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 dirty you're gonna to have to run your uh, sensitivity at like 55, 60% on those days where it's you're almost at a full high tide and we haven't had any rain for a couple of weeks, you might be up around 80, 85%. So you, I would suggest having a play with manual, manual sensitivity for Western Port because I think that's where you're going to get your most adva advantages. Um, but as I've, as I've mentioned at the start of the, the chat, don't be afraid to run some higher sensitivity, especially when you are sounding around sound upstream find those partial arches mate so i think western port's like a perfect example of looking for those snapper looking at those drop-offs um, some of those reefs out there there's obviously jewelries out there in western port as well um, i would run it in manual run that sensitivity a little bit higher what you're just focusing on that bottom third anyway mate so it doesn't really matter without all the clutter and crap that's going to be running through that water column with the tide um and contrast oh, yeah you got me again <laughs> so you got all this committed to memory paul no oh, i should shouldn't i <laughs> um come back i'll come back to you on that one race let me um i will respond in the comments section because you made a facebook comment i will find it for you and i'll respond after the chat mate apologies from memory it was around that 80 percent mark as well yep now, Ron's also asked the question, has this been recorded for viewing later on? Yes, it has. It's on my YouTube channel. It'll be on Paul's Facebook. It's on my Facebook. I put a link in there to my YouTube so you can go back and watch this again. And there's been oh, probably a dozen or more other Sonar Master classes over the last 18 months as well that are all on that channel. So you can go and watch any one of them if you want to. So... Folks, I think the questions are starting to slow down. I think um, Paul and I are probably starting to slow down as well. My, my, my voice throat's... is starting to slow down. That's yeah, my throat's starting <laughs> to get a bit sore. So we get to start to wrap it up. So look, thank you, uh, Paul, for coming along today. Thank you for sharing some Pleasure. great screenshots and a wealth of knowledge. Uh, thank you, everyone, who came along and participated tonight for some amazing questions, really great questions tonight. Appreciate that. That's what makes these sessions so powerful is people asking questions. So thank you so much for that. And everybody, have a great uh, have a great evening. If you're in lockdown, hang in there. Hopefully the fishing's not too far away. If you're not in lockdown, get out and fish while you can because you never know when you will be in lockdown. <laughs> Bad to say that's the way it is at the moment, folks. Thanks again. Good night, everyone. And we'll see you in the next Sonar Masterclass in a few weeks' time. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you guys.